And a lot of people that are not preparing for what's about to happen are not going to make it. And maybe this is the way nature cleans out, you know, the place or something. I don't know. But if you're listening to this, you, you, you should get aware of what's happening. You need to take care of yourself physically. You need to take care of yourself spiritually. You need to learn the truth. That's really all that's important. Well, we're talking to Acharya S. Uh, you can see her site at, uh, oh, now I forgot that I came down from mine. Uh, oh, well, I'll figure it out here in a second. What's your site, Acharya? Truth I know I said be known. It, uh, Truth be known, yeah. Truthbeknown.com is one site. Okay, where are the others? StellarHousePublishing.com. Stellar House? Stellar yes. House Publishing? Stellar okay. House well, Publishing. She's got articles up there, and uh, here it is. I finally came up on my computer. Got a slow computer here. It, and, uh, and really good stuff, and you need to read it because learning the truth about religion. And, you know, I have a friend who's a... Uh, um, quite a well-known intellectual and he tells me that that the age of Aquarius is coming here within the next two years around 2010 and he assures me that Christianity will be completely disappeared off the planet in just a few years because he thinks that it was completely a Piscean uh, mm-hmm. uh, 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 cultural phenomena, I guess you would yes. say. Yes. Yeah. Are you are you familiar with this uh, theory? I I think it's a rabbi from Seattle um, about the uh, uh, the Roman family that was the in Jerusalem. Yeah. yeah, the Pisos. What a great theory. Um, uh, yeah. What, what well, do you think of that theory? Yeah. I'm, I, I, this, what I have in common with that theory is that uh, I believe that. Jesus Christ is a mythical figure who was contrived by the priesthood in order to unify the Roman Empire under one state religion. Mm-hmm. Uh, other yes, than that, they differ with the details. Now, all this stuff, including what you brought up earlier about the Old Testament figures being mythical, this is all in my, my first published book, which is called The Christ Conspiracy, The Greatest Story Ever Sold, by the way. <laughs> And uh, and I do delve into this notion that uh, there is no historical evidence for you know, Moses, the Exodus, uh, Abraham, Solomon. Yep. Abraham and mm-hmm. Sarah seem to be the Indian god and goddess yes. uh, Brahma and Sarasvati. I go into this kind of detail in the Christ Conspiracy, as well as what you were just talking about, this whole Piscean, Aquarian uh, um, timeline. That it appears, you know, if you if you go and you look at the meanings of these myths, and you find out that they are astrotheological, that they have to do with the sun, the moon, the stars, and the constellations, and so forth. That we are dealing with these ages that are uh, of the procession of the equinoxes, and they had to do that's about every 2150 years or so. The uh, the uh, Earth, the sun rather, is backdropped by a new constellation at the horizon as it rises. It's called Heliophily. So uh, that's where these age names come from. And that the ancients were pretty well aware, the more educated, the priesthood and so forth, were pretty well aware of these various ages associated with the possession of the equinoxes. And in fact, of course, they started to name them and, and um, chart them way back then. And so that there was this sort of deliberate contrivance around that period when there's a, there's a uh, no man's land, so to speak, in between the different ages uh, of uh, a couple hundred years or so. And so I haven't really been able to get a straight answer from a, an astronomer as to when exactly these ages would change. They, they say that they say there's this, this kind of sketchy period. But around yes. 2000, 2100, 2025, uh, maybe more or less uh, years ago, this we supposedly moved into a, a new age. It's, it's, you know, the the technology back then was, um, well, it was different, obviously, than what we use today to chart time and so forth. But uh, there was this belief that we were moving into the age of, of Pisces, and therefore that's why we have all of this discussion in the New Testament about fish. You know, Jesus yeah. and the fishermen. There's the fish on the back of people's cars. It's actually an ancient symbol. Uh, there's the... Uh, Fish is the communion food because when Christ is resurrected, he asks for fish. It's like, you know, why would the resurrected God need some food? This is a, a hint that that we are dealing with this astrotheological development here. And, mm-hmm. you know, prior to that, we had uh, Moses, and he's destroying the, the bull worship, 
and uh, kind of raising up a, a, a lamb. They're starting to slaughter less bulls in the um, Judaic uh, practices as we, and as more we switch lamb. From Taurus, as we go from Taurus to Aries. Exactly. Exactly, yeah. and then you know the calling of the shofar, the ram thorn, and so forth. There's this whole like kind of yeah. lamb stuff going on there, and we find that in other cultures as well. We find mm-hmm. other gods right. that are associated with the lamb, like Krishna and uh, Horus and so forth. And all these motifs start to become very common and very obvious, and they're, and they're much more interesting. The the way that they incorporated all these cosmic elements into the uh, religious thought and mythology of the day is much more interesting than the this, this story of God coming to Earth 2,000 years ago in this little backwater. It's only 90 miles, the area where the uh, gospel story supposedly took place. This tiny little backwater in you know a, a kind of a desert region that God supposedly came to Earth at that time for a few years. You know, you know, he, he, he ministered for like two or three years and then was killed and. And uh, and that's how God is going to fix the sins of the world. This story has really become corrupt and not not very attractive or interesting at all. It's uh, in fact it's been the source of a lot of uh, uh, grief on this planet, yeah. <laughs> to say the least. That's for sure. Yes. Uh, and I don't yes. want to see it replaced <laughs> by anything worse either. So what? No, what, I don't the, either. The best way through all of this, as far as I'm concerned, is to know what these motifs stand for, and that no culture has a lock on God. You know, no culture is depicting God accurately in uh, 100%. Uh, and that there, there also has to be room for this, this idea that we don't need to follow an organized religion. We do have innate morality, and that will allow us not to destroy our neighbor in the name of religion, in the name of God, not to try to enslave our neighbors and uh, other human beings in this in the name of this God. And in order to, as you, as you said, if you study the history and the origins of religion, then you are free, really, of that belief because uh, you start to realize there's a much bigger meaning to this stuff. And it's not, it doesn't have to do with one guy who's dictating rules that so we all have to follow or will be killed or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I agree, and uh, I think it's the beginning. I think w- your books like what you're doing, the books that you're writing, and and things like this are really the beginning of a of a, a serious re-education about what religions are. And I think you're right. Religions, especially Christianity, was created by the Romans to control populations because it was too hard. The Roman Empire was too big. I'm Jay Widener. Listen to Smoke and Mirrors. We'll be right back. Thanks for listening.